Good afternoon and welcome to the ESAP Specialty Alloys live event. My name is Clemente Tolarico and with me as the presenters, we have Mr. Peter Stones as well as Mr. Per Oki Björnstedt for technical support. I'm pleased to announce here the eighth presentation of ESAP Specialty Alloys, which will happen every third Friday of the month at 14.30 European time via team live events. The eighth presentation of the program will be the one starting in a few seconds with the title, What do you know about welding cryogenic materials? We will be very happy to answer your questions at the end of the presentation, which you can type in in the Q&A box you will find on the top right of your screen. We intend to present on about 30 minutes and take 10 to 15 minutes more for answering your questions. So, and with that said, now let us start with the show with Peter presenting. Enjoy. <clears throat> thank you, Clemente. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining this, uh, the, the eighth presentation. Uh, as Clemente said, we intend to talk for about 30 minutes, so there's an awful lot of information included in here and it's really not necessary to, to take notes. If, uh, if you see something that you like, you want more information on, then both Clemente's and my contact details are available at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to either call or email and, and request a copy of the slides. Uh, and if you think of some questions that you can't think of in the next 30 minutes, then again, please, by all means, just uh, drop us an email. No problem at all. So the, we want to talk about cryogenics. It's a, it's a funny word, uh, becoming more and more uh, prevalent these days. So what does cryogenics mean? So I've just listed there the, the, the listing out of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Cryogenics, production and application of low temperature phenomena. So cryotem cryogenic temperature range is defined as being from minus 150 C and it goes right down to absolute zero. You can't get colder than minus 273 Z. Um, that's the kind of temperatures we're talking about. And what I want to do uh, around the topic is present what are cryogenic applications? Why do we, why do we need to operate in temperatures so cold? Um, very specifically, uh, what properties do the metals, not just the filler metals, but the base metals need to have for applications that are so cold? Um, what is it? What's the difference between ordinary uh, base metals, ordinary filler metals that make the cryogenic ones so special? Um, what are the grades? And obviously we're a welding company, so we will talk about welding. There are some uh, useful pointers to be taken into consideration whenever you start welding uh, for these applications. So specifically uh, cryogenic applications, we're talking about uh, the temperature of liquid oxygen. That's really when things start. That's what we said from minus 150 to minus 273. Um, the, the coldest um, element that we're dealing with is liquid helium, which is down, down to minus 269. Minus 269 is a uh, is a particular set of problems. You, you can obviously, you can't get much colder. Um, and testing, for example, at those kind of temperatures is, is quite difficult and, and not too common. Um, why are we always talking about liquid gases? That seems a, a strange contradiction in terms. We're talking about a liquid gas. Why do we liquefy gas? And, and the reason is very simple. It's for volume. The volume of, of uh, of, of, of an oxygen gas is very, very much bigger than the volume, uh, the, the, the volume of liquid oxygen. So that's why we convert the gases into liquids. It's uh, to make it easier to store and transport. And the applications that we're using for, not surprisingly, frozen food, um, LNG, liquid nat natural gas, liquefied natural gas, is one of the biggest applications in the world, really, for cryogenics. And that's purely the, the size of the business at the moment. Uh, obviously, MRI type machines uh, require a lot of refrigeration. Uh, rocket fuel is, is particularly special. And what's becoming more and more prevalent these days is hydrogen. Hydrogen power. Um, 
the, the, the technology is really starting to come into its own and we'll talk about that later. So um, down to minus uh, 100 C, we can see we're talking about ethylene, ethane, ethylene uh, temperatures. Then, uh, or rather I'll start at the top end, at, at zero, then carbon steels and fine grain, 2% nickel steels are absolutely fine. Uh, so we wouldn't class them as being cryogenic. When you're getting down towards minus 100, then we need something a little bit more exotic. So something that, uh, with a little bit more nickel in it, basically, to, to hold everything together. Uh, so the, the base material that's typically used down to minus 100 is, is something like a 3.5% nickel steel. When you get down to uh, beyond minus 100, and we're talking liquid natural gas, then it's very typical to use 9% uh, nickel steel. So that's got its own particular um, methods of production. It's got its own particular uh, requirements for, for welding. Beyond that, there is life uh, beyond LNG temperatures. Uh, and again, it's, the, it's the, the four biggies, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and helium. Uh, in here, you need something better uh, than a 9% nickel steel. So we need to be talking about austenitics uh, or these invar materials, which are 36% nickel, um, aluminium alloys even. So as I said, in, what represents the largest uh, in, in terms of volume, the largest market in terms of volume, numbers of tons of base material and filament materials, it, it's, it's really in LNG. Um, because these are the type of storage vessels that uh, that need to be produced uh, for for storage and transportation. So uh, the the technology really has been based around uh, LNG production. So utilizing low temperature mechanical properties, then something uh, that always needs to be taken into consideration is this thing this phenomenon called ductile to brittle transmission temperature dbtt it's uh, it's a phenomenon that's observed in most metals and uh, as a as a design engineer and as a welding engineer then uh, you need to be aware of this phenomenon basically what it's saying is that the uh, at, at room temperatures uh, then what could be perfectly acceptable with a, a, a nice ductile structure. Uh, once you start to cool it down, so the as the temperature is reduced, then it goes through this transition from being ductile to being very brittle. And depending upon the, the grade, the alloy uh, the, the, that's in question, these temperatures, the temperatures obviously change and the, 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 the steepness of the curve changes. So that means that it, it becomes brittle, quicker, slower, whatever. Um, so what could be very happy working in the UK would uh, be completely unsafe working in north of Norway, for example. It's as simple as that. Um, all ferrous metals, apart from austenitics, exhibit this transition temperature. Um, however, nickel, nickel, because of the way that uh, on a um, on a macroscopic scale, microscopic scale, the way that nickel is uh, is made up, that nickel nickel-based alloys don't present this transition temperature. This is the reason why. Uh, in previous talks, I've gone into detail on the the composition of nickel alloys and the reasons why. Uh, they exhibit the, the, the mechanical properties that they do. So based on their, their composition, the way that they're made, then they don't exhibit this, this ductile brittle transition temperature. That's why they're used. Um, obviously, as the, the base material for an LNG tank, it needs to be ductile and crack resistant. Um, and that's why we're using things like stainless steel, aluminium and nickel steel. Obviously, depending on the size, um, determines the thickness, the, the relevant tensile strengths, uh, means how much volume of base material is needed. And one other point that the LNG is, uh, it's at 
uh, minus 163 is liquid at minus 163 centigrade. So typically it's stored at minus 170. So there's a little bit of a safety measure there. However, um, when specifying the base materials and the filler metals, we, we specify them with properties at minus 196. So uh, the, the reason being that that's a very uh, typical common uh, temperature at which uh, test laboratories can 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 operate and it's because it's the it's the temperature of liquid nitrogen. So we're using liquid nitrogen to uh, basically test for LNG fabrication. So if we know that the the properties of the filler metals and the base metals are all right at minus 196, then to handle minus 170 should be no problem at all. And that's why that's what they do. So the idea of using the the nine percent nickel steel is it's a it's a it's a low temperature, uh, economical low temperature alternative compared to something like a, a three or four L stainless. Um, because it's it's high strength, then you can reduce the thickness of the of the the walls in the tanks. It's got enough strength to support. Nine percent nickel can be welded without brittle fracture. Um, it's uh, it's a low alloy content, like we said, so it's economical compared to 304L, for example. Uh, it is readily weldable. It's not susceptible to cracking and it shows little deterioration of post welding properties. Um, Preheat and post heat treatment not normally required uh, at these kind of plate thicknesses. Uh, one thing in particular, provided low hydrogen consumables are used. One thing to watch out for that, that's not common. Um, so uh, someone operating in this kind of environment for the first time, uh, this needs to be taken into consideration. Magnetism, it, it can be a problem. Um, handling and uh, moving these plates around, uh, you, you have a great risk of increasing the, the magnetism within the base material. Um, if it's not possible to demagnetize, if there's a magnetic flux density in the steel, then that can cause all kinds of problems when welding, uh, specifically the arc bloke, the arc goes where it wants. So um, what we would recommend is a, a, a flux density below 20 Gauss. If it's above then, if it's above that and it's not able to, to be demagnetized, then AC welding would be recommended. So in terms of uh, welding solution, the, the, the little tips and tricks, what, what needs to be taken into consideration with nickel based alloys um, is that they are usually very, very low in ferrite or even zero ferrite. And what ferrite does in there, um, if you remember, we, we call them austenitic stainless steels like a, a 304L or a 316L. We call them austenitics, but they're not super austenitic. They're, they're austenitic, meaning that they do contain some ferrite. The nickel alloys are in the super austenitic region, which means they have very little ferrite. What ferrite does um, is absorb some of uh, any impurities that are within the steel. So uh, you can have a very pure, very um, high quality filler metal, but the base metal, um, there may be uh, some kind of impurities in there, and it's usually either phosphorus or sulfur. Sulfur, sorry. Um, when you're welding and you're diluting, um, you, you're diluting the sulfur. The sulfur goes into the into the weld metal. You're actually changing the uh, the solidification temperature of of that part of the of the metal of that part of the weld. Basically, um, the uh, whilst you're welding, the, the the strength of the weld is not sufficient to hold it together, uh, and then you get these kind of phenomenon hot cracks down, right down the centre of the weld. Um, so, without having sulphur in there, then any kind of impurities can cause a lot of problems. And also, what to, what we should realise is the microstructure of these nickel alloys, they have very, very large grain sizes compared to you know, other steels. So the large grain size means they've got very few grain boundaries and it's the grain boundaries, explained in a very simple fashion, 
it's the grain boundaries that, that lock together that create uh, the strength within um, within the microstructure. Grain boundaries lock together, they bump into one another, they tie together, and that's what creates the strength. With the nickel alloys, they've got very big grains, so very few grain boundaries in, in comparison. So any impurities in here have a very large impact, a much larger impact on the weld metal than say in a, in a, in a 316. So that has to be, uh, you have to be careful with that. Again, we're talking specifically for 9% nickel steel, we're talking LNG. We will go on to talk about other metals, uh, other grades uh, further on down the presentation, but we're talking now specifically for the 9% nickel steel. So uh, a matching 9% nickel filler weld metal uh, is not suitable because uh, of dilution, you wouldn't get the strength. Um, it would need heat treating to enable it to be uh, to be used. So obviously the weld metal's got to match at least the strength of the steel, as well as have good ductility at minus 170. So it, it is not really only the nickel base consumables that can do that, uh, that have got that strength, that integrity uh, at that low temperature. Um, one other uh, plus point for the nickel based uh, consumables is they, they put an austenitic weld metal down. So again, the, there's reduced risk of hydrogen cracking, whereas we're, we're increasing uh, the risk of hot cracking, there's a reduced risk of hydrogen cracking because it's austenitic and not ferritic. Um, ah, basic SMAW and submerged R fluxes will give a clean deposit in this 9% steel. In terms of the, uh, the, the, the requirements, the uh, specifications requirements, then um, in terms of ASME, the, the requirements are for a, a, a six, yield strength of 690 pascals. Um, and the, the, the project spec uh, that we see typically is 70 joules, either 50 or 70 joules at minus 196. Um, so which alloys, which alloys are used for these 9% nickels? The main ones by, uh, by far are either nickel chrome moly 3, nickel chrome moly 4. So alloy 625 or alloy C276. Um, these are the ones, the two grades that have been used uh, extensively over the years. We've certainly got lots of experience and uh, we've got hundred, literally hundreds of installations using either the nickel chrome moly 3 or the nickel chrome moly 4. Um, the, uh, the, the prevalence really of, of 625, nickel chrome moly 3, is that it's really a commodity. So uh, the, there's a lot of people manufacturing this grade at the moment. So it tends to be cheaper. It's more readily available than, than the C276, but um, uh, whichever is absolutely fine. In terms of the tips and tricks uh, for, for welding, the techniques to use, we would say absolutely use a filler metal. If you're welding nickel-based alloys, always use a filler metal. Don't do autogenous welds. Without a preheat and without post weld heat treatment. Again, something that we, we tend to say an awful lot of the time is keep the heat input low. Um, we always say that with stainless steels, with duplexes and with nickels. Um, keep the heat input as low as possible and typically using a maximum of 1.5 kilojoules. We've mentioned it before, so it needs, uh, it needs saying again. If magnetism is high, when we said that the level is around about 20 Gauss, um, use AC welding. This uh, little diagram here is explaining uh, the, the need to use a convex weld bead rather than concave. So if it was a, a, a butt weld, then uh, we'd rather see more weld metal on the surface rather than a flat, a flat weld or a concave for a fillet. The idea being that you, you need some metal in there, you need sufficient metal in there to hold everything together. Um, this really, it, it won't have the strength to hold everything together as it starts to cool down. That's when you start to see some cracking. Um, obviously, part of that is a, is a good fit up. If you have lots of residual stress in here, 
at, at the fit up, then these these alloys don't lend themselves to uh, to to, uh, to holding everything together without problems. So keep residual stresses low and use a convex weld bead. Uh, stringer beads, rather than weaving, uh, really to reduce the heat input, the less time uh, that you're spending weaving, uh, the better. So stringer beads, more more runs of stringer beads rather than one big uh, weaved uh, bead. That means you're putting less heat into it uh, and we're trying to keep the heat input low. Uh, avoid dwell, we said here, and backfill craters. Yeah, you don't want holes in there. You don't want a crater. Uh, there's no strength in that. You need you need the well metal to, uh, to to keep it together. And again, something that we've uh, we've said before about stainlesses and duplexes, and it's very relevant for the nickel-based alloys, is joint preparation. So before you even start welding, then it's essential uh, to design the joint such that it has wider root gaps. As a rule of thumb, generally, the more highly alloyed the filler metal is, then the less it wants to flow. So the, the fluidity of the weld pool is uh, is not very good. Uh, it doesn't want to flow. So in order to ensure that you get in flow and full joint penetration, full sidewall fusion through the joint, the joint has to be a little bit wider than you would normally expect for something like, say, a carbon steel. So the, the root gap needs to be wider and the angles need to be more open. Whether it's a V, whether it's a J. And again, there are tables that we have uh, to illustrate that. Again, uh, dwelling on um, LNG, ESAP have, uh, have produced this solutions handbook. So this is very specifically um, a complete portfolio of everything to do with uh, uh, fabricating LNG storage tanks. <clears throat> Such that we've got diagrams, uh, representations of storage tanks and every joint. Uh, every joint has its welding process, a recommended welding process, uh, a recommended filler material uh, at every stage. There's 43 pages in that. Uh, it is downloadable from the ESAB website if that's something that you're interested in. Um, but like I say, uh, please drop me a line uh, if you can't find it and I'll, uh, I'll gladly help. So we, we've talked about uh, LNG ad nauseum, but there are, as we mentioned, there are the four other gases that operate at temperatures below 196. So uh, the material of choice for this is, is different. Um, hydrogen is the one that's coming into play more and more often. And what I've done here is I've just uh, copied a, a page of the Gov UK website. So UK hydrogen, this is just the UK hydrogen strategy. This is uh, this is big numbers. Five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen produced uh, by 2030. So if you take it into context that the cellar field, the, the nuclear power station that's been uh, refurbished, the new reactor being put in there is to produce three gigawatts. Uh, and the government are setting its stall out to make five gigawatts in basically the next nine years. It's a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal number. It's huge. So obviously the, the hydrogen has to be produced. Um, and it, it has to be produced in the UK. We, we, uh, we're not going to transport this thousands of miles. So the hydrogen has to be produced and it has to be transported. Uh, and then it's obviously has to be uh, delivered uh, door to door, as it were. So this is a phenomenal business that is taking off in a very, very big way, certainly in the UK. Uh, TWI have a number of projects that are working on, on hydrogen. Um, the colours of hydrogen, depending on how the hydrogen is produced, uh, determines whether it's a green hydrogen or a black hydrogen. So you produce hydrogen by uh, sustainable means. So if you're using solar farms, wind farms, wave power, then that would be green hydrogen. Uh, and at the other end of the scale, you can produce hydrogen using nuclear power. It seems a bit strange, but uh, again, the TWI are taking it on board in a very big way. It's, it's going to be some uh, very big projects coming up. 
if you have £54,000, then you can buy this hydrogen powered car, which would be fine if you had one of these next door, um, which is a, a hydrogen refueling station. So the way that this works is um, the car obviously has a hydrogen tank. You fill it over with liquid hydrogen. The fuel cell basically produces electrical energy and its byproducts is essentially water. This is why it's so nice and clean and it's going to come on board in a very big way very soon. Uh, and then you've got an electric car. So rather than using a battery, you're using a, a fuel cell that converts hydrogen into electrical energy. And these are available now. You can buy one of these if you're in the right place. So again, these things are going increasingly popular. Uh, and this thing is a off the grid electric vehicle charging station. So this is uh, essentially what we saw in, in, in the car, in the vehicle. It's a hydrogen tank that, with a fuel cell that's converted, that's producing electricity. So the idea being that this thing doesn't need to be plugged into the national grid. It doesn't need to go into the mains. It's powered by hydrogen and producing electricity specifically to charge electric cars. So uh, these can be deposited anywhere like in the middle of the desert, the jungle, whatever. Um, so it's making the potential um, utilization of electric vehicles a lot more real, a lot more accessible uh, than, than today. I, uh, it's difficult enough drive, driving from uh, John and Groats to Land's End in an electric vehicle. You have to plan it out. These things are going to become more and more popular. So the, the materials that we're talking about here, we're talking about uh, austenitic stainless steels uh, predominantly. So this is the same chart we saw before that had the LNG at 9% nickel steels. So for the uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, helium, then we need something like an austenitic stainless steel, the 36% nickel, an invar, or some aluminium alloys. So um, two grades that, that we have that I particularly want to, to mention because they're, they're quite special. So we have a, uh, 1912-3L cryo, so it's a, it's a 316L, but it has a much lower ferrite than a typical 316L. The, the ferrite uh, is, is normally 2 to 5, uh, is, is between 2 and 5, I should say, but normally it's 3. Uh, so with a, a ferrite number of 3, uh, this means that it's usable down to minus 269. Um, the Sharpie value, the, the impact toughness at minus 196 is 70 joules. So these is certainly one of the materials of choice for uh, hydrogen tanks. Uh, the other grade that I want to specifically mention is this 308. We've got a, a 308 L grade. Uh, again, it's, it's got um, at minus 196, it's 75 joules, so it's even better than the 316. However, this has got, uh, is tested, it's approved. We've got, um, uh, we've got approvals on this for minus 269. We've got a, a, a toughness value of 40 joules. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a practical application. It's a practical um, solution, I should say, for uh, hydrogen tank applications. So it, it's currently in use, it's becoming more and more prevalent. And really, uh, to, to finish off, I just want to uh, list or go through the portfolio that we have. Um, all of these grades, and I don't propose reading them out, but obviously we've got uh, we've got MIG, we've got TIG, we've got submerged arc, we've got flux cord, we've, everything, every, uh, every welding option. Um, and all of these are being used for cryogenic application somewhere. OK, so we've got a huge, huge range uh, of this. Uh, flux cord, I mentioned uh, submerged art with fluxes as well. So thank you very much. I think my 30 minutes is up. Um, thanks for your time. Um, you can see Clemente and myself uh, have our contact details there. Please feel free to, to get in touch with us uh, if you think of something uh, later. Uh,
the one other thing I just would mention is the the next presentation is on uh, basically the importance of consistent quality of filler wire and we'll introduce the ESAB e e e robust feed as well and that's on the third Friday of November which is Friday the 19th so thanks very much Clemente. Thank you Peter well received as well thank you uh, all of you for the participation and the good questions highlighted so I will start with the first question that we have and the first question is why are the nickel alloys prone to center line crackings? Peter Perroque, what are you saying the, on that uh, question? Perroque, do you want that one? Uh, go ahead, you have already explained that one, so in a very good way, so go ahead. Uh, the, 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 because of the, the grain size of the, of the nickel alloys, as I mentioned, the, the 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 grain size is very big, and the 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 grain boundaries, the number of grain boundaries, is very small. So, uh, the the in in terms of uh, strength and toughness uh, in liquid solution, these don't want to hold together, and they're very prone to uh, impurities. Impurities would generally come from your base metal. Um, so any traces of phosphorus and sulfur affect the microstructure even worse, and it changes the uh, the solidification temperature. So you have areas that, that basically don't solidify. They don't solidify quick enough to hold the weld together. Does that explain it? Perok, you got anything else? Uh, good enough, sir. <clears throat> okay. Good. So I come to the next question that we have. Uh, where can I get the copy of the LNG solution handbook? I believe it's available. I thought it was available on the ESAB website. If anybody's having any trouble, please uh, drop me an email and I can uh, I can sort it out. Good, fantastic. Um, I come to the third question and it seems that this is the last question that we got so in total we got only three questions so it seems that um, you were very clear or um, <laughs> uh, sorry you have uh, you have uh, three more questions uh, four now ah. yeah All so right. go, go, go ahead <laughs> okay good ah okay now I see yes that's uh, right um, I have this one here what are the uh, approval for Exoton Cryogenic 99L? That's for you, Peroka. Yeah, sure. We, we, we have two approvals for uh, both of them. But uh, for TIG, we have a quite unique approval uh, down to minus 269, actually. It's a TUF approval. And uh, we also have a, a DB approval. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So now it starts to become more interesting because we are get more questions. So do you recommend specific ferrite numbers of austenitic welds on the cryogenic applications? I would say that you should be, uh, I mean, a typical number would be around five, six, we, we recommend up to uh, maximum eight for these type of alloys. Uh, but uh, uh, for example, 99L, we are around five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. um, and for the 316L, as uh, Peter pointed out earlier, uh, we actually have a, an average so far of around 2.4, 2.5, around there, three. Yeah. So that is the range we. Uh, we uh, see as uh, fits the, the purpose best. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have the next question for the Exoton 316 means the 1912 3L cryo used for minus 269 degrees C. Does it ensure lateral expansion above uh, O? 0.38 millimeters. Uh, yes, we we have done tests uh, showing that we fulfilled that. 
and also we have shown that uh, uh, as extra information to this, uh, we are above uh, 40 jugs uh, as well at this time. Mm. Uh -huh. All right, thank you very much. The next question, I will go quite quickly so we can hold the time as well. Did you characterize hydrogen embrittlement resistance with 308L or 316L welds? What is the best choice? What is the best choice between 308 and 316L welds? I don't think we have done that investigation. Uh, I don't recognize that. Yeah. You're anyway. talking specifically in terms of hydrogen embrittlement? Yes. No, I, we have to look that up. Uh, I haven't seen an investigation so far. No, we. Um, I, I don't recall ever being asked for low hydrogen grade, to be honest. You know, the, the, we do a low hydrogen super duplex, for example, but I, I've never um i've never come across anyone asking for a low hydrogen uh either 308l or a, a 316l so sorry. maybe th maybe they are referring to um, covered electrodes uh, but we need to come back uh, on that one if it, if it is co covered electrodes they are uh, referring to yeah please whoever whoever asked that question please drop us an email and uh, we'll investigate and get back to you I have another question here. Which solution can be used to do the Charpy test at minus 269 degrees C? So which sol solution? I'll go ahead, Peter, show the slide. <clears throat> um, yeah, it has to be uh, liquid helium. Yeah. It's the only it's the only uh, it's the only thing that's at that temperature. So you have to find the laboratory that can handle uh, liquid helium, essentially. That that's the thing. It's not so common, as I said. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's only a couple of laboratories uh, here in Europe that yeah. can actually do these tests. And also, when you when you do the test uh, and take out the sample, it will quickly uh, be be warmer than this, this minus 268.9. Yeah, so, so you that, have to, that is a tricky to, part also. <laughs> you, have to, you have to freeze everything. You have to freeze every part of your equipment uh, that, that it touches and freeze the uh, the environment. And yeah, it's, um, it's tricky and it's expensive. <laughs> All right, and I think we are coming to the last question. And the last question is, um, Explain about the basicity in submerged oak welding fluxes. Uh, it's not my forte, Baroka. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, uh, to be honest. So uh, the question is explain I mean, about what, what is basicity? Yes, mean? exactly. Let's start with that. I mean, the, the, the lower you are in basicity, um, uh, in in the flux, uh, the higher the impact strength uh, normally is. Good. And uh, how I can get the lower basicity in the flux? How do you get the lower basicity? Yeah. Yes. Oh. What is what is uh, influencing the lower basicity? Exactly. Uh, I don't remember the 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 elements that are uh, included in the. Uh, you should have my colleague here explaining this. Um, you have to come back on that as well. I don't remember the, the elements that is important here. Yeah, it is at, at the end, it is the elements that you have in the in the flux, yes, which absolutely. is supporting yes. the basicity. And I'm baking a cake, it's a recipe. Uh, yes, and exactly. And it alters, alters the flavor. Exactly. And then lower the basicity, higher the impact strength. But at the same time, it's also um, not so easy to weld. Let's say if the basicity is uh, um, is lower than yeah, it is different than if you have a higher basicity during the welding process and the slack removal and the slack uh, building and so on. So that yeah, has and, and normally the slag removal is uh, more difficult with a uh, higher basicity. Exactly. Good. All right. So please note down Peter's and my contact details from the screen. 
we are already now very happy to answer further questions and give some more clarification to your question that you have uh, brought up. With that said, we wish you a successful rest of the day and see you soon in the next live event in one month. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.